Cleveland, Ohio, the 29th of December, 2016. This Cessna Citation CJ4 had just been cleared for takeoff from Burke Lakefront Airport. There were five passengers on board and one pilot. Shortly after takeoff, the aircraft began to climb. It then climbed through its cleared altitude of 2,000 feet. Shortly after, the aircraft nose dropped and the aircraft then descended through its cleared altitude and continued to descend before it made contact with Lake Erie just two miles northwest of the airport. To understand why this happened, we have to rewind just a few hours to earlier that day. The pilot and the passengers started their journey in Ohio State University Airport in Columbus, Ohio. They were attending a sporting event in Cleveland and it was a short 30 minute flight from Ohio State University Airport to Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland. The pilot, who was a 45 year old male, had a total of 1,205 hours and 56 hours on type. He had only recently just passed his single pilot type rating for the Cessna Citation CJ4, which he passed on the 8th of December 2016. The aircraft, which held the registration November 614 Sierra Bravo, was fully serviceable and had its last inspection in October 2016 and its last maintenance work carried out on the 17th of December 2016. The pilots and passengers then boarded the aircraft about 1700 hours on the 29th of December. The aircraft took off at 1730 from Ohio State University Airport, and the flight lasted about 30 minutes before arriving at Burke's Lakefront Airport at 1800. The pilot then checked in, and the pilot and the passengers then attended a local sporting event before then returning to the airport about 22.30 hours. Not long after arriving, the passengers boarded the aircraft. They got themselves strapped in the back, and the pilot entered the cockpit and strapped himself in. He then requested a start, taxi and clearance for their return back to Ohio State University Airport. The pilot then received his takeoff clearance. He was cleared to climb to 2,000 feet and turn right onto a heading of 330 degrees after takeoff. The pilot acknowledged the clearance. He then updated his flight instruments and then at 2255, he was cleared to take off. As the flight was at night time, obviously he couldn't fly visually, so he was flying under something called instrument flight rules. So for him to fly accurately, he had to use his primary flight display. This is usually referred to as a PFD. And most of the instruments that he would require for instrument flying would be held within that PFD. To help us understand what he was looking at, we'll just quickly run through the instruments that he had available on the PFD. So in the center of the display, you have something called your attitude. This shows what position the aircraft is in relative to the horizon. On the right hand side of the PFD, you have the altitude. And on the left hand side, you have the indicated airspeed. At the bottom, you've got your heading display. And the one that's most important for us to understand in relation to this incident is at the top of the PFD, you have the flight control system display area. And this shows if the autopilot is engaged or not and in what mode it's in. This becomes extremely important very soon. So at 22.55, the aircraft was clear for takeoff. The passengers in the back were all strapped in and the pilot was ready to go. All of his instruments were updated. He then increased the thrust levers to take off and 15 seconds later, the aircraft became airborne. The pilot, who had now been awake for 17 hours, then engaged what he thought was the autopilot and continued with his after takeoff checks. Unfortunately, the autopilot had not been engaged and the pilot at this point was not aware. The aircraft continued to climb and climbed through its assigned altitude of 2,000 feet. The automated voice enunciated altitude and then again 14 seconds later. It's then heard on the cockpit voice recorder that there's a decrease in the engine power. It's worth noting at this point that the aircraft doesn't have auto throttle so with a lot of bigger aircraft, with the autopilot, it has an auto throttle, which controls the thrust. With the Citation CJ4, it doesn't have auto throttle. So the pilot is always in control of the power. This explains why the pilot reduces the power. And it also confirms that the pilot still believed the autopilot was still engaged as no other control input was noticed. At this point, the bank angle had increased to 62 degrees 
and the pitch altitude decreased to 15 degrees nose down. The pilot then received an excessive bank angle warning and at the same time was contacted by the tower controller instructing the pilot to contact departure control. The pilot then replied to departure 614 Sierra Bravo. However, that communication was not received by the tower controller and suggests that the pilot did not push down the push to talk button. At this point, the angle of bank had reduced to 25 degrees, but the aircraft had now reached 300 knots and was descending at 6,000 feet per minute. The controller then again attempted to contact the pilot, asking them to switch to departure control. And again, the pilot responded with 614 Sierra Bravo. This again was not received by the tower controller, but heard on the cockpit voice recorder. The pilot then got a sink rate warning, followed by several pull up warnings. The cockpit voice recorder then picked up a sound similar to the overspeed warning before the aircraft then continued its descent and collided with Lake Erie, just two nautical miles northeast of the airport. The crash killed all six people on board. So why did this happen? What were the contributing factors? So from the e-final report, it was determined that it was a controlled flight into terrain due to pilot spatial disorientation. Now this was due to it being nighttime. Obviously the lake doesn't have any lights in it. So from looking out the window, there's no difference between the sky and the ground, further making it more difficult to identify where you are. Obviously contributing to this was the pilot's fatigue. He was awake for 17 hours before this trip. And it was noted that as he was relatively new to this aircraft, there had been negative transfer due to the flight guidance panel and the attitude indicator being different on the pilot's previous aircraft. So this means that after takeoff, potentially muscle memory took over and he pushed the wrong button, not engaging the autopilot when he thought he had. But overall, the main issue here, if you remember back to when we spoke about the PFD, was that you have the display at the top of the screen, which shows you what mode you're in. So when you're flying on instruments, that is crucial, especially when you're using the flight director or the autopilot. The fact is that if he had engaged the autopilot and looked at the top of his PFD, he would have had an indication to show that it either was or was not engaged. So it would appear, as there was a lack of action to deal with the situation, that he was unaware until very, very late that the autopilot was not engaged, therefore suggesting that he didn't actually check his instruments. But this obviously leads on to a bigger issue, one that you've probably heard before, where automation dependency is encroaching on pilot skill set. But this one goes a little bit further, as the reliance on the automation was so strong that it wasn't even checked that it was actually working correctly. Now, understandably, this is a smaller private aircraft with only six people on board. However, this is similar to many other incidents one in particular being the Air Asia flight that I've done in one of my previous videos, which you can go and check out, where the pilots thought the autopilot was engaged, but by the time they realized it wasn't, the startle effect was so strong, it led to a catastrophic stall, which eventually killed them and all the passengers on board. I'd love to know what you guys think. Is automation dependency encroaching too far into aviation? And should more be done for pilots to retain core flying skills? I'd love to know your thoughts. Also, if you like the video, please, please drop a like and please do subscribe if you want to see more of these videos as it would really help me to then continue making more of them. That's all for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.